Hi everybody, uh, I want to share with you a read aloud from 50 Cent's book. It's called um, Hustle Harder and Hustle Smarter. That's the title of the book. This part of the chapter is called Back in the Barrel. Um, but before I do that, don't forget to like, subscribe, and message um, your thoughts on this, what we read today. Like the video, subscribe to the channel. Another mistake people make time and time again is that they've, after they found success, they feel they, they owe something to the place they came from. This is especially prevalent in the African American community. When a black person from the hood reaches a certain level of success, they seem to feel obligated to maintain their roots. You don't see this nearly as much in other communities. If a Chinese immigrant works his ass off for years and builds a chain of his own stores, he'll probably be moved to a big house in the suburbs the first chance he gets. He won't feel like he owes anything to his fellow immigrants back in Chinatown. He'll do what, what they do if they come in, came into money, too. Move to the biggest house in the safest neighborhood with the best schools that they could. Same with the Mexican woman who grew up in the barrio. If she ends up through hard work and, and hustle becoming a real estate genius, she's probably not looking to stay in her own hood. Nope, she's getting that big house in the nice, safe neighborhood, too without any guilt. When the Irish, Italian, and Jewish immigrants started making money, the first thing they did was beat, beat it out to the suburbs. It seems like it's only in the African American community that we have a hard time walking away from our struggle. If we don't stay connected to that struggle, we'll somehow lose whatever it is that made us successful. I know that, I know that feeling very well. Being afraid to cut the um, umbilical cord to the hood is why I, is why I bought Mike Tyson's place but at least I had the sense to bring the hood to me. Instead of staying in the hood itself, I've known a lot of people who made that mistake and some who paid the ultimate price for their unwillingness to walk away. A tragic example was my friend and mentor Jam Master Jay, who was from Hollis, Queens. As a member, member of Rum DMC, Jay personified the pinnacle of success in our neighborhood. He sold millions of records. He toured the world, rocking stages from Europe to Asia. As part of the first breakout hip-hop group, he was an inspiration to millions of black kids in Queens and around the country. Once they hit the big time, the rest of Run DMC left Queens and never looked back. Rev Run and DMC went to New Jersey, and their manager Russell Simmons set up shops in, in Manhattan. But Jay stayed in Queens his entire life. He opened a recording studio in Jamaica, where he taught aspiring local rappers, myself included, the finer points of constructing a song. It seems like a great story. Local DJ becomes famous, tours the world, and comes back to his old stomping grounds to share his gift with the next generation. In reality, it was a death sentence. By staying in Queens, Jay never separated himself from the negative elements close to hip-hop, especially in our hood. In Queens, the drug dealers were the first people to have real money. Hip-hop was a hobby, just something to do with your homies on the stoop or in the park. The cash was in selling drugs. Jay's generation was inspired by what the drug dealers had. Nice clothes, fly, fly cars, and beautiful women on their arms. The peacoats and God, godfather hats that Jay helped make famous with Run DMC, that's what he saw the drug dealers wearing. Same was the gold chains Run DMC and LL Cool J later helped popularize. They represented drug culture fashion before they became hip-hop. Today, the opposite is true. Rappers can make way more money than drug dealers, thanks in small part to the path early pioneers like Jam Master Jay helped blaze. Jay's mistakes, mistake was that he didn't keep moving forward. If he'd followed Run, Russell, and DMC to Jersey, Long Island, or Manhattan, I have no doubt he'd still be alive today. Instead he chose, instead he stayed too close to the wrong kind of people, people who not only didn't have his best interest at heart, but were actually jealous of his fame and success. They didn't celebrate him for staying in the neighborhood and mentoring aspiring MCs. They actually hated him for it. By staying around folks like that, he made it inevitable for sucker, sucker shit to happen. It was a similar situ uh, situation with Nipsey Hussle. I didn't know Nipsey as well as I knew Jay, but he seemed like a stand-up guy. When I agreed to shoot the video for YG's Toot It and Boot It, which Nipsey was featured on, I told the guy at this record studio, hey, make sure you bring that kid who looks like Snoop. That's how we met in person. Nipsey was a great dude who, who seemed focused on both his community and his family. 
<clears throat> Sadly, the same sucker shit got Jay, also got Nipsey. When Nipsey was killed, people started pointing fingers at everyone except those suckers. On Twitter or IG, the first thing you see was the government killed Nipsey. The, the logic was Nipsey had been working on a documentary about Dr. Sebi, the famed Honduran herbalist who some felt had been jailed and later killed because of his controversial views on Western medicine. Doc, Dr. Sebi's teachings were a threat to the pharmaceutical industry, so Nip, Nipsey had to be killed before he could spread the word. To hear other people tell it, Nipsey was a threat to the government because he was teaching the hood about financial empowerment and social justice. If too many people, too many poor young people became enlightened because of Nipsey's work, it would threaten the status quo in Los Angeles. So he had to he had to go for that. There is no doubt Nipsey was doing great work in the hood, especially with Vector 90, a, a co-working space and STEM training center that taught tech skills. And though I thought. And though I don't have any strong feelings on Dr. Sebi's teachings, I wouldn't be shocked if there were some elements in the pharmaceutical field who wanted to keep it that, that work under wraps. But when people say the government killed Nipsey, they're just not being honest or, or, or realistic. The government didn't kill Nipsey, allegedly. Some sucker killed, some sucker killed Nipsey. And that's the depressing story. He didn't kill Nipsey because it, because Nip was a threat to any status quo, and no one paid him to kill Nipsey to protect Pfizer or Johnson and Johnson. He was killed because he was a he killed him because he was a hater, plain and simple. He was a snitch, and then Nipsey called him on it. So he acted with violence. He couldn't stand that someone as successful and beloved as Nipsey didn't want someone as unsuccessful and untr untrust untrustworthy around. So once again, this is um. This is in 50 Cent's book. Um, this is about um, basically people who are afraid to leave the hood once they become successful. He says the crab in the barrel mentality is what killed Nipsey, just like it killed Jay and so many other successful black folks who stayed in their community after they found success. That's why when I started making legitimate money, I left the hood and never looked back. Sure, I'll visit from time to time, but I'd never move back permanently. If I did, there is zero question I would have been neg negatively impacted. Hey, once again, if you like the video, like it, share it, subscribe to the channel, message me. Peace.